Thank you, everybody. We, we now will restart our workshop with presentation on technical and associated challenges in establishing a viable SMR. That will be delivered by Professor Akira Tokuhiro. Akira, please. Yes, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Can you confirm? I can see the first title slide. Yes, we see, but this is in not not in full screen. Ah, so we have this problem again. So we, I may <laughs> have to. Okay, you try. You try if still we have a minute or two, if possible. Otherwise, just go. Like what I do here, I also learned it this week. I start full screen PowerPoint presentation and then it has two windows. Okay, it looks now. No. <laughs> no, oh, okay. First I start this PowerPoint in full screen and it, it shows the two windows. Then I, I start share screen from here and select the big window, which, which is with full screen. Ah, I see, okay. So let me try to. So first you start it and then come back with Alt tab to this browser window and then share screen. If not okay, you just maybe minim minimize. Uh, no. Okay, I, I, I just keep, I just start. I hope you can see the, the title slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Okay, I just, I just go, yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Vladimir, and the organizers and, and, and the students. I think you had a very interesting week. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person, uh, but uh, it's, it's a busy time of the year. Uh, so I will talk about the technical and uh, some of the related or associated challenges in establishing a viable uh, small modular reactor uh, initiative in the whole world. Um, I think you saw this on Monday, uh, just, uh, I hope you all just, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I use LinkedIn quite a bit. Um, happy that, uh, to see the name of particip the list of participants, uh, all of you, except maybe one or two, uh, I know in person. So thank you very much for that. Um, to start, um, I, I think we, you know about uh, this slide. Uh, this is one of the most used slides in the nuclear energy world. Uh, generation f one to generation four reactors. Uh, just uh, some important points. We are, we will, in your, in your, maybe in your career, you will reach 2040 and 2050 when we have to get to net zero carbon. SMRs roughly started a lot of progress in about 2010, 2011. We are already at 2022, at the end of 2022. Uh, generation four reactors, uh, I think the initial conversation started in about 2000. So uh, it, this tells you about the nuclear world it doesn't change very much compared to, to for example, the software world um, which changes quite a bit. So that's just the, and we have about 425 operating reactors. Uh, I can tell you now, um, we need, um, as I said on Monday, in, in some of the models on how many nuclear power plants, large and small, uh, do we need to, to, to counter or combat uh, climate change or get to net zero carbon? We need something like 4,000 more than or more, so we need uh, 10 times more than what we have now so um for me the question is how can we get to f four you know not uh for not to have 430 nuclear power plants but 4,000 nuclear power plants large and small uh throughout the world uh in a very short amount of time so okay 
So let's talk about uh, both small and micromodular reactors. Uh, we have them uh, in many places. We have research reactors that are very small or micro, uh, but they don't have energy conversion systems and they do not generate electricity. There are some, a few examples, but few is not uh, having 400 or 4,000. Okay, I, I talked a bit about this on Monday I hope the slides are advancing. This is the startup uh, financing cycle, commercial sector slide. Um, it, what, what, what has changed uh, since about, well, um, compared to 1990 or so, 30 years ago. Sorry, Professor, I think the um, slides are not uh, working as you might be. Uh, okay. if, you share, if you share the, the wall screen instead of the window, you should be able to, um, uh, to let My us screen? see. Yeah, instead of the window. So if you get, uh, get out of the, presenta of the presentation and the screen okay. sharing and select uh, share the whole screen, we can see uh, exactly what you're seeing. Okay. Uh... Okay, how's this? Do you see the, are my slides changing? Here's a, a standard slide. PowerPoint window, maybe. If you sh share entire screen, I well, know. Entire screen. It may be the, the entire screen. Let just try to sh uh, to make the presentation with F5 or the, the button. Uh, okay, how's this? Do you see the title mm. slide? No, still not. Ah. This is a problem. It's like you have two windows. One is standard PowerPoint windows for editing and another for presentation. So we see the standard, not window for presentation because. Okay. Okay, stop sharing. You see me, yeah, now you see me, so, yeah, okay. Yeah. So this, this. Uh, I guess one option, if you click share screen, and I see here entire screen. When you click entire screen, you see everything what is on, on your screen. Or you have, you have two monitors, I guess. Huh? No, I have only, today I only, I reduced, I changed to one. Share. Do you see the, any, the slide? And now if you click this F5 or Go full to the screen? full screen mode. Okay, how is this now? Still the same, the same PowerPoint. Okay. okay, do you see this slide, the title slide? Now we see the first slide, title slide. Yeah. Okay, I I, I will go with this. I hope you can. I hope yeah, yeah. I it, ask, it, you, yeah. You I, just I, I, ask for your patience. Okay, mm -hmm. so I, I switched to my uh, career slide. I hope you will uh, connect to me on LinkedIn. Uh, just so that's what I said. Okay, so let me jump to this slide, which I hope you see. Evolution, um, we see evolution of commercial. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, the evolution is, is the most used slide. Uh, and, and what I said before was that from generation one to generation four, and then to 2040 and 2050, uh, we have to get to net zero carbon by 2050 or so at the earliest. We have about 425 operating reactors. I can, as I said, uh, how, many, how many large and small reactors do we need to get to net zero carbon um, and to, to replace all the power that's electric, electrical power that's being generated by fossil fuels, coal, especially coal and the natural gas and petroleum. Uh, we need about 4,000, at least 4,000. So the question is, can we build, can we increase the number of nuclear power plants throughout the world uh, to 10 times what we have today? Uh, it's, it's quite a big challenge for us, right? In the next 30 years, can we get to, to more than a thousand reactors, more than 4,000 reactors is the, num the type of numbers we need for 8 billion people and the electricity demands 
that uh, we have. Now, remember, what what I, I often think about what is urgent. Urgent is when you have to ch charge your cell phone, right? That's that's really an immediate um, uh, task that you have to do. And that's, where is that electricity coming from? And that has to come from a nuclear power. Okay, let's talk about small and micromodular reactors. Um, there are some examples of micromodular and small reactors today in research reactors throughout the world, but they don't have energy convergence systems and they do not necessarily generate uh, electricity uh, or have distributed heat. Okay, I, this is number slide number six is a startup uh, financing cycle and commercial sector. Uh, I talked about this on Monday. What has changed since 1990 compared to, to Westinghouse and General Electric and Hitachi and other large companies, uh, we have, in, in, in certainly in North America and some in Europe, US, Canada, we have uh, small modular reactor startup companies. And remember, they have they operate on a different, different financing cycle. They have to have investments in order to make um, progress in their engineering and design. Uh, and this is the, you have to remember the startup cycle. Initially, when you start up, you are at doing everything at your own cost. And then uh, startup people have, um, you, you have, I have these four questions, you know, they, uh, they, they, do they want to have a startup to make, to sell the company, a successful company eventually, and then retire young? Or do they want to do something good for humanity and then undergo uh, some financial hardship because they believe what they are doing is very good? Uh, so they're, 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 that's different from a commercial company uh, like General Electric uh, investing, uh, being in the business of nuclear power. So um, you have to know that difference um, that uh, the, the fin essentially the financing cycle and the investment cycle is, is different for startup companies compared to traditional nuclear vendors. Okay, uh, the other thing that's important to know is the technology readiness level, uh, one through nine. This is in Wikipedia. Uh, I would ask you to look at Wikipedia uh, technology readiness level. This is important because uh, you may have a very good idea, uh, but it may be you're at the technology readiness level number one. And um, uh, in order to get the technology readiness level eight or nine, it takes quite a bit of time or even seven uh, system prototype demonstration and operational environment is really a large uh, a large scale uh, engineering demonstration in a near commercial type environment. So um, technology, technology um, uh, readiness level number five, for example, technology validated in a relevant environment, maybe a test facility. Uh, it, that, all those things take quite a bit of time. So you have to think uh, about the technology readiness level. Okay, and I just have an example of a picture of the airline industry. They have the same kinds of uh, uh, constraints. Okay, here's uh, slide number eight is just another uh, 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 slide on the technology readiness level. This is from Wikipedia. And then um, again, technology level one to nine. Okay, now uh, the other thing about startups is that uh, with small modular reactors, especially in 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 uh, North America and a little bit a few companies in, in Europe, um, they live on the idea. So that idea is is intellectual property or proprietary, and you see the black box. It essentially that it's a it's an SMR, but you don't know many of the details. So. Uh, you have to keep that in mind. The regulator may know some details, but then to the public, that's, um, that some of the details of the design are protected and it's hard to know what's exactly inside. So that can be a problem for the public to access 
uh, in terms of the information. Okay, now let's look at the, um, beyond the investment, um, slide number 11. Remember that um, nuclear engineering and the scales of engineering are one of the most uh, challenging in engineering design because the, the length, energy, number, distribution, information, and time, uh, if you just look at the first uh, letters, L-E-N-D-I-T, I call it LENDIT, uh, are, have the, some of the biggest and the widest scales, like the energies may go from uh, 10 to the minus 3 MeV all the way to 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the plus 7 MeV, and the time um, may go from um, from uh, femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 15 seconds to thousands of years. Uh, so uh, you're during uh, doing engineering and and in, in, in design uh, in in over this very wide range of, of scales. So this is why nuclear engineering is interesting, but it's also a very big challenge. Okay. All right, the other thing that's difficult um, with uh, traditional nuclear en reactor engineering and codes is that because it started in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, even earlier, uh, many of the, the computer codes are still uh, in the Fortran structured programming language. And uh, we have changed uh, since that time. Um, and we don't really teach, um, uh, at, at least in the US and Canada, we don't really teach Fortran. So you have to learn that on your own. Um, although as an, as an older person, I, I learned Fortran at the uh, university. Um, now you know uh, people are learning HTML and, and Java and, 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 and Python and so forth, and then um, Fortran is some of the codes are un unfortunately still in Fortran version, and uh, you have to um, learn Fortran to, to make sense or to work with Fortran, uh, Fortran based codes. Now, what else has changed is uh, we have. Uh, new software like GitHub or sites or platforms like Slack and GitHub. And some of the, uh, fortunately, some of the coding is, has been done so many times it's, it's shared. So GitHub is, is a, uh, you don't have to write the original code for a certain routine because it may be uh, already available on Slack or GitHub or some of these other newer platforms. Okay, and then uh, the other problem is that uh, some of the codes like MCMP uh, are uh, Melkor and Relap even are controlled uh, and they're not e easily available for everybody in the world. And some of the control is coming out to the Radiation Safety Information Computational Center, RSICC out of Oak Ridge National Labs. And then uh, you might not be able to get uh, the latest version, but the, maybe an older version of a code like uh, Relab, okay? Okay, slide 13. Um, yeah, because uh, I, I just want to say that because compared to a large water reactor or larger reactor design, because uh, of this uh, smaller scale of small modular reactor and the simplicity in design, it's po much more possible to integrate and model and simulate much more than larger uh, large water reactors. Uh, the analysis is is uh, should run faster in principle, uh, and the, we should be able to look at more details of the design. Does somebody have a microphone on? Please turn that off. Okay, slide uh, 14. Uh, again, uh, uh, the technical needs in SMR safety and design. I, I use this term safety and design for to capture the design in engineering. Uh, you have the regulatory body and the licensing strategy to get your design through the regulator. You have to certainly have um, 
a probabilistic safety assessment of the design or risk assessment of the design. You certainly need system analysis of the design. You need accident analysis of the design, really to, to, to get um, the potential source term. And what is, that, what, uh, what is the magnitude of the source term that can go offsite from the reactor through dispersion analysis, and then um, back to, to the current design philosophy and design approach. So uh, you go in a circular iteratory uh, process to do, to, to do the design. Now, when I say the SMR is, is uh, design is simple enough, one example is that you're deciding between, for example, a safety relief valve. You may only have three safety relief valves and you may be thinking about adding a fourth safety relief valve, relief valve. So the difference between three and four safety relief valves in um, typically in an integrated PWR SMR design can change the accident scenario or the accident sequence. So um, because it's smaller and you have much fewer components, whether you have three valves or four valves, safety relief valves can make a large impact on the, on the behavior under accident conditions. So that's why um, uh, the details are important on the accident, especially on the accident revolu evolution uh, or the time dependent uh, sequence of events uh, in, in, in a small modular reactor, okay? So um, yeah, and, and project-wise, you may not be able to freeze the design to say, okay, no more changes to design. This is the final design for our SMR before we submit it to the regulator. In, in project management terms, you may be at 80% completion, but you may still be deciding between a, a, a design with three safety relief valves versus design with four relief valves. So, um, but you have to come to a point where you 85% project management completion percentage, you say, okay, no more changes. We will do, we decided on four safety relief, relief valves and we have to go with that design and no more changes, design changes, for example, okay? All right, again, the same uh, six um, uh, aspects of, of um, SMR design. And you have to also remember from this slide 15 aspects and specialization that in some of the SMR designs, you're saying that um, the design basis accidents in a traditional sense for large water reactors are, are zero, reduced to zero or not applicable. And that you cannot have, because of the goodness or, or the greatness of the design, that you cannot have a beyond design basis accident. All right, and you may have as a result a core damage frequency, CDF, perhaps smaller than 10 to the minus eight or smaller. Uh, and you have to have an incredibly small event or a sequence of things that can happen. Like uh, for example, the Fukushima, you have a very large earthquake and then a tsunami. The, this earthquake probability may be small, the tsunami uh, probability may be small, but it can happen. So um, you have to think of, of um, let's say a small break loca, large loss of coolant accident, that itself may be small, but you may have another event that can happen. Uh, so you may have overall a core damage frequency of 10 to the minus eight or 10 to the minus 10, something very small and, and uh, uh, you have to consider, even though it's not possible from your design, you have to think of that as a possibility uh, to the regulator or, uh, and the regulator may say uh, that we don't believe that the probability can be 10 to the minus 10. Uh, we cannot, we don't have a position on something so small, uh, but we are convinced that it, 
for your design that it's incredibly small and it's not likely to happen, okay? Now, uh, insect 10 is, is uh, look on Wikipedia or on Google. Insect 10 is a design philosophy that's very important. Uh, there are five levels. Uh, you may make the design to meet all five levels that you cannot have uh, level one, level two, level three. But it's also possible to design to say your design is made so that you, if you are at level one, the design is makes it very difficult to get to level two, right? So again, I'll say if you are at level one under the insect 10, five levels, it, the design is, is such that it's very difficult to go from level one to level two. So that's another design approach that you can take. And um, overall, what you want to do is that you don't want to introduce human intervention because human beings can, uh, are typically human beings, human operators under stress can make mistakes and you don't want human intervention in order to in order to prevent mistakes made by human operators right so that's something that's that's important to remember in the overall design process as well and then if you have a small uh, source term and a dispersion is very limited then you can have a small emergency planning zone epz uh, and that's typical for a small modular reactor okay Slide 16, uh, just to say that um, uh, just some features of uh, the triple crown, what they call a triple crown of, uh, at least in the West, of um, high level objectives and functions of the design. No, DC, no AC or DC power necessary at the plant. Uh, the plant, as it's often said, the plant can operate on, on, on island mode, meaning it can operate on its own electrical power and not require power from the grid because from the earthquake or tsunami, the external grid may be out and you may not be able to uh, to have electrical power coming back into the nuclear power plant so that I, the power plant itself uh, can work on island mode. So so those are some of the, 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 the these are some of the, key, the questions that are asked to have a good design in the SMR. Okay. All right, so I talked uh, uh, a little bit, slide 17, I talked about uh, 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 passive safety systems a little bit. I'll talk a little bit more about that. I talk, certainly talk about insect 10. Here are the five levels. And with respect to, I'll talk more and more about uh, pa passive safety systems, PSS. Uh, here are the five levels, as I said, uh, in the SMR space, you really want to only work in levels of defense in depth, uh, levels one, two, and three. And uh, because four and five are already um, severe accident conditions and mitigating severe accident conditions. So you want to make the design uh, good enough and without human intervention needs so that you operate even under the worst conditions at level uh, of defense in depth number three. And you make the design so that if you are one, if you have abnormal operations or failures, it's difficult to get to level two. Okay, here's, the, here's uh, some different levels, the defense in depth levels from INSAC 10 on the very left, some target frequencies in terms of probabilities per year uh, some attributes there. And then you have what are called PRA, probabilistic risk assessment levels one, two, and three. These are approximate correspondences between defense and depth and PRA and the current regulatory requirements. Uh, this is not a, a absolute uh, correspondence, but these are some um, interpreted correspondences and there's some differences that still need to be resolved. And you see that uh, 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 the probabilities that are listed in the second column from the left are very small. Level four and level five, let's say are 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 12. So very, very small 
probabilities and uh, there may be some differences between um, you, the designer, and the regulator who takes a position if they take a position on the probability. So that has to be discussed early uh, in the design process. Okay, here are some uh, more into the technical details. Uh, here I've, I've taken the example of the um, uh, ESBWR and uh, the Panda facility that was at the Paul Scherer Institute in Europe, um, SMR technology, some design simplifications compared to the evolutionary um, simplified boiling water reactor, ESBWR, and now that design is 30 years later has become, for example, the BWRX300, it looks very similar. Uh, and you have this passive uh, safety system for this BWRX300, for example. So, um, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Slide 20. Um, yeah, so linking the three elements, probabilistic uh, risk analysis or probabilistic safety analysis, PSA or PRA, system analysis and accident analysis, and then the reactor design, uh, and the lessons learned uh, maybe over 30 years uh, in the case of, for example, for General Electric, uh, all, the, all the things that eliminate some of the higher level um, design objectives like human intervention, the triple crown, um, defense in depth, uh, you really have to integrate and have activities and in, in, um, integrated activities in reactor design safety and that system analysis, accident analysis, and PRA, PSA. Okay, now slide 21, time evolution of events, including accidents and PSS. Uh, what we have used in the industry is what I call, or what some call uh, classic PRA, classic probabilistic safety assessment or risk assessment. And these are discrete models um, and there's a software uh, for making the PRA PSA model. And as you know from your education, probably from event trees and fault trees, uh, these are classic PRA is our discrete events in time and they happen um, ide in an idealized world automatically. But there is another um, dynamic P uh, probabilistic risk assessment or PSA dynamic, which includes, explicitly includes time as a variable. And so you know much more with dynamic PRA, the evolution of the of events that happen with the system that you design. And that's important. And you can do that with SMRs because the system is simpler. The overall system is simpler uh, so that it's amenable to, to, to computational models and simulation. Although for even for large reactors, um, uh, software models uh, and simulations are possible, but you need uh, more computing resources. So for the design engineer, it, uh, for an SMR, for design engineer, you may be able to do a dynamic PRA analysis on your laptop as opposed to uh, having a computing cluster on high performance computer. So um, slide 22 is, is, is just a, a very busy slide, but in the US, uh, there's a documentation called um, uh, Code for Federal Regulation, CFR, 10 CFR 50 Appendix A is, is a thing uh, called a general design criteria, GDC. And it has a list of about 50 design criteria for how um, re, um, objectives that have to be met when designing a nuclear power plant, okay? So this is one regulatory approach. The US NRC takes what we call a prescriptive approach or a checklist approach and if you have to meet all these criteria, if you design a reactor, uh, other regulators may have a different viewpoint, but if you consider the US one, it's useful because when you think about the completeness of your design, 
of an SMR in this case, or a micromodular reactor, then you can go to criterion 25, for example, and make sure that you have this, taken this criterion 25, for example, into consideration. So if you look, uh, this is this one for protection systems, for protection system requirements for reactivity control malfunctions. Um, so um, these are design criterion, for example, that does uh, talk about the field design limit not to exceed uh, for any single malfunction of the reactor reactivity control system, uh, such as accidental withdrawal or rod ejection or rod dropout, uh, control rod dropout. So uh, you have to design the system and the reactor so that even with a rod accident, a control rod uh, withdrawal or ejection accident, that you still have some reactivity control. So. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a checklist in a sense for the goodness in, in design. Okay, slide 23, uh, safety, safety uh, SMR design features that challenge a conventional safety analysis. Uh, these are just examples of generic eliminated scenarios in your uh, small modular reactor. You may um, design the, the the reactor so that you don't have large um, piping connections in the design, only at the very top, for example, and nothing at the bottom. And it may be impossible to have a large break loss of coolant accident because you don't have any penetrations into the pressure vessel, for example. Um, and that you do by in introducing an integrated reactor cooling system feature. So you see in some designs already that you don't have any penetrations at the bottom of the pressure vessel um, or even the containment uh, so that it's hard to have any loss of coolant accident, okay? All right, so uh, slide 24 is just an overall um, uh, schematic of uh, the safety, appro uh, safety assessment. The classical approach is the PRA, PSA and then the deterministic safety analysis or safety assessment. And the integrated approach is that you combine these two. And in, in addition, uh, that in coupled to the design. So you have to, as I said before, you might have to think about um, in an integrated approach, what happens to the PSA and the safety assessment and the accident analysis when you have three examples of, is an example, three safety relief valves versus four safety relief valves, okay? All right. So here's a, here's a detail of uh, passive safety systems and you have uh, at least at this moment, uh, four different types. And this is what I was, this is an example of what I was saying that the evolution, the time dependent uh, evolution of the accident can be dependent on the type of passive, here in this case, passive residual sy safety system that you may use for your design. And they are a little bit different for each type of SMR design, okay? So here are four, and here are in, 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 in graphic form, passive residual heat removal system. I'll go back, that's the, number one, and even with number one, you have three different types, and you can see uh, that type three is very different than type one or two, and even type one or two uh, is, is, uh, is actually very, very uh, slightly different, and you have to really look in detail to see uh, if uh, the difference between type one and two. But uh, one thing to remember is that uh, in passive residual heat removal systems or passive designs, you don't have a pump because you, you eliminate the pump to have uh, and force circulation, you eliminate your option to have force circulation without a pump uh, and you operate the reactor on natural circulation. Uh, and natural circulation is at a much lower velocity uh, or mass flow rate than force circulation, but maybe the safety system is um, is and the normal operation is okay 
acceptable on natural circulation. Okay. All right. Slide 27 is uh, potential advantages of implementing a passive safety system in an IPWR type SMR, uh, some design characteristics. Uh, for example, a uh, lower core power capacity is facilitated by uh, uh, less decay heat remo to be removed or smaller magnitude of decay heat removal. So if you have a small modular reactor with lower thermal output, of course, you're going to have a decay heat to be removed that's smaller and that you may be limiting the output thermal and output capacity of your small modular reactor so that it can be uh, cooled. Um, ultimately, if you go to a micro modular reactor, the ultimate heat sink is really air. So, and that's not really much different than having uh, a water cooled uh, uh, automobile engine design or air cooled, like the Volkswagen Beetle is an air cooled, uh, some of the smaller, um, the original 1100 cc a cubic uh, centimeter design is an air cooled design, right? So it's only uh, when they increase the capacity to 1300, 1.3 uh, liters, then they have to use, um, beyond that point, you have to use uh, some liquid cooling. So. If you have a lower core power capacity, for example, you may you have less decay heat to be removed, for example. Okay, so here's a slide 28 is just a detail, much more detail on the evaluation metrics for a PSS, passive safety system among um, I uh, integrated pressurized water reactor designs. So these are PSS types of PSS systems and you look at the cooling time, the redundancy and diversity, and for R and D, and R is for the redundancy, D is for diversity. So you can see some differences, and the evaluation metrics are for um, a paper by Williams. Uh, but you, you, what this really says is that when do you use your passive safety systems, and are are you using um, uh, what type of uh, PSS passive safety system design are you using? And that can really impact the time evolution of your accident sequence. So the getting to the end here, the, um, the, the importance about this, the whole thing is that you're going to have uh, for SMR design one through nine, for example, you're going to have some uh, rank, if you had a ranking, some of them are going to be better than others or best or good or expected or minimum, um, depending on your passive safety system design. Okay, so this is, this is just to suggest that uh, not all SMRs are alike and, and the passive safety system design uh, being different in each type of SMR some are going to uh, perform um, in a better manner than others. And um, you may not, the regulator needs to know this because uh, the designs are different. The public may not know it because that the detailed information is hard to, to access. Okay, just to give you some uh, uh, references, I mentioned the uh, pro, uh, paper by Williams um, that is really, um, uh, a good paper in terms of the defense and depth metrics and new reactor designs. Uh, I would recommend that as uh, for reading. Uh, just a picture of two of my former uh, master students, Ye Mi and uh, uh, Churu um, Zeliang uh, from India. And then I just want to say in slide 32 uh, about low, medium, and high uh, in terms of digital twins. Um, digital twins are needed, but in terms of engineering and design, if you need uh, high performance computing or cluster based computing, uh, it may not be practical. And you may be talking about details that really do not matter, uh, but may matter because of the smaller, when the reactor is smaller in design, your safety margins 
also may be smaller and you need to check if your safety margins and uncertainties in the modeling and simulations are smaller and to make sure that they are not critical um, uh, factors in the safety of the design. Okay, uh, I talked about uh, on Monday about uh, complexity. Overall, if you take a systems level view, um, the complexity, if you think of the number of variables and parameters, then you have a complex process. You often use heuristics to optimize the entire system, whether technical or non-technical. And I talked a little bit about uh, Pareto, Pareto and, and these are available in Wikipedia. So please look at complex system analysis and, and, the, and, the, and the parameters that I introduced or the heuristics that I introduced are the lended parameters. I talked about this in the very beginning uh, for systems, uh, for thermodynamic systems, pressure, temperature, mass flow rate, valve position, and liquid level are very important. And, and at, during accident analysis, system, state, resource, and response are applicable. You have to know the state of the system. You have to know what resources you have. They may be engineered or non-engineered. Uh, you may have um, an emergency diesel generator. You may have a fire truck as a resource and you may be able to use that in the responding to the, the accident event that you may have. Okay, in summary, uh, slide 39. Um, these are not in, 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 um, in, in any order or priority. You may have, uh, we have today uh, some 80 current SMR designs. Um, and I think uh, a smaller number will get to the end Getting to the end means for me, um, finishing construction, starting the operation and connecting to the grid. You uh, pouring concrete at a site is the beginning, uh, but pouring concrete does not guarantee that the plant is construction will be finished. Um, the operational testing, uh, the core uh, first criticality, getting up to 100% power, connecting to the grid is really the most most important. So um, some things that I worry about, do you have a, enough, uh, enough of a workforce? Do you have, um, uh, how many how many SMRs can be constructed simultaneously in the world is, 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 uh, is important. Do you have enough funding? Uh, you make sure that in order to finish the construction that you have a sufficient number, of, uh, sufficient funding. Is there regulatory approval? Is there support? Um, in, in Russia and in China, Argentina, and some other countries, uh, you have a different financing uh, model uh, as, as well. So that's important to remember. So uh, with that, I'll take some questions. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Akira. Now we have several questions. Let's start from chat. And one question from Ibrahim Balarada Mansir. My question is, does the SMR design is robust and the loss of power accident since there is no human intervention during decay heat removal? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Uh, what, what I meant is that um, you have to rely on passive safety system design most it essentially means natural circulation um, and the operator and those happen automatically in that you are able to remove uh, decay heat and assuming that you have a natural shut uh, uh, a natural shutdown system so the reactor is in shutdown but you have to still remove the decay heat and that requires no judgment or intervention by the operator it happens and that requirement may be uh, within the first 24 hours, first 72 hours, maybe within the first week. Depends on the regulatory um, requirement and expectation. So, and that can impact the SMR design. So I think you have to think of that upfront uh, on whether you, the regulatory uh, position is that you have no human intervention within the first 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours or one week. Okay, thank 
you. Any so other hopefully questions? that's a that's a partial question answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from audience. Uh, thank you, Professor Tokohiro. Uh, I'm uh, Sayyid Ali Husseini. I have a question uh, about uh, dynamic PSA. Uh, you uh -huh. know, one of the, your slides says that uh, dynamic PSA is a potential for using in a small modular reactors. Uh, but NRC not accepted the dynamic uh, PSA or dynamic PRA as a requirement uh, there isn't no document for dynamic PRA, even for PWRs or LWRs. So uh, how we can make a practical way for SMR safety assessment uh, based right. on a, a dynamic PRA? Yeah, That's my so first question. I, I, thank, I thank you for that question. It's a very good question. So the regulatory requirement is that you have a classic PRA and, and, and that satisfies the regulatory requirement. The research, if you want as a vendor, want to know more details in time evolution of the, re, of the reactor, you may want to have an internal dynamic PRA analysis to, to keep as part of your knowledge base it's not it does not you're right it does not mean there's not a regulatory requirement for dynamic pra but you may want to know as a company and use dynamic pra for example in in japan uh even classic pra is not a regulatory requirement but the utility owner and operator of course, has a classic PRA model, and they do simulations uh, to to know much more detail about what can happen, how it can happen, and this is the same case for dynamic PRA. So, is is that uh, partially an answer for your your good question? Uh, yeah, I uh, agree with you to going toward the uh, IDPSA, dynamic PSA best estimate tools in licensing process, uh, but uh, there is uh, many uh, restrictions, uh, regulatory restrictions. How, but uh, if, if about in related to the SML modular reactor, uh, if we should come back to the uh, uh, conservative uh, strategies, I think it's uh, full of drawbacks and rollbacks for uh, safety. Uh, yeah. And th thank you for your uh, uh, specific uh, answer. Thank you so much. And I have another question uh, about mm -hmm. later, uh, later, later. Please, later. Okay. We'll, you will have a chance if we have time. Okay. Now let us accept another question from. I see that also Alessio Luvara has two, even three questions in in, in one. Uh, I just will reformulate first question. Why do you rely on this outdated, stupid Fortran language? Why not to develop a new software suite with more updated programming paradigms to be used by all different, to be used by all different proposing SMR microreactor vendors during design phases and even beyond? Yeah, so that's, I, I'm, I'm glad for that, that comment. Uh, it, it is a very silly situation. Uh, and, and, and I don't know what all the software tools that all the AT SMR vendors are using. But um, some of them, I am assuming that some of them are using uh, free or cost-free old SMR or old reactor system analysis codes or PSA codes, and they might be even written in Fortran language, and maybe Fortran 2000. They Maybe they have been converted from Fortran 4, which is an old version, to Fortran 2000. But it's still an old, old structured language, and it takes some time. You need to hire a, a software engineer to convert, uh, and that's really not productive time. 
to convert that Fortran 2000 to some other modern language. Uh, and this is where the change comes. You might be, you may make that code available on GitHub or Slack or some shared global site for for the better, you know, for the for, to facilitate the wider usage of tools, software tools for the entire community. Um, and uh, on that, I just want to answer that one other question. The the role of the IAEA is very important in in some of these new methods like dynamic PRA because they are able to, to get all the stakeholders together to say to have a discussion about some of these about some of these newer methods and standards and expectations of newer methods. Uh, and it, it may it, it does take time. It may take 10 years before we have a consensus as a community, a global community, in 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 saying that we should share uh, we should get away from Fortran based uh, nuclear and nuclear reactor design analysis or, 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 or use of dynamic PRA versus classical PRA. So uh, just to give you a short answer, I hope that's the case. I hope I, I see that. Yeah, I see also Adrian answered it in the chat. Adrian, could you just add to this? Any, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, sorry, I couldn't resist uh, answering in the chat. I love Fortran because it's such a nice language. But it, uh, and the, the, the fact is just that a lot of old code is written in Fortran, and the uh, legacy code is what we call it, and not just in the nuclear industry, but also in the automotive industry and lots of places. They have lots of code, tens, hundreds of thousands of lines of code in Fortran, but it is hopelessly outdated. And therefore, universities don't teach it anymore, and new codes are written in C or C++. Now, one point that is very important, though, is that there has to be a standard. And Fortran has a standard. If you have a Fortran statement that adds two numbers, then the standard says what the result should be. In Python, it used to be a long time that, well, depends on the version of Python that you have, whether the division gives you this answer or that answer. That's not something you can use when you build a nuclear reactor. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, Fortran is still around a lot. And I personally love it, and I would, <clears throat> I would be very happy to teach it. So back to, uh, back to you. Thank OK. You. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sir Dali, your second question to, to Akira, please. Thank you. My uh, second question about the uh, Passive safety system, the uh, other uh, part of uh, your presentation. Uh, uh, passive safety system uh, from the reliability point uh, data is, a, despite of the many uh, advantage, is a challenging issue. Uh, uh, you recommend that uh, the, about the advantage. Uh, so the uh, dynamic PSA uh, or PRA is a uh, uh, potentially challenging uh, for SMR with the passive safety systems. Combine the passive safety system with the dynamic uh, PRA. How uh, we can do in this situation, uh, in your opinion? Thank you. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So uh, I, I often uh, worry about this as well. For example, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you have natural circulation and have much lower uh, coolant flow rate velocities, for example, okay, as a metric, and you need the reactivity control and you're going to use uh, boric acid injection, uh, the question is where do you add the, the reactivity control is in the core. Where do you add the boric acid? If you add it beneath the core, then you have a penetration into the pressure vessel, for example, and you could have a small break loca. You introduce a small break loca. But it's the most effective in the shortest time frame to have a reactivity control. If you do not want to have any small break loca possibility, you introduce uh, the boric acid midway or above uh, the core or further away from the core, and then you have to wait for the boric acid to traverse all the way down into the, into the bottom of the reactor pressure vessel and then into the core. 
then there's a lot of uncertainty in that calculation. So um, you have to actually look at both in terms of dynamic PRS, PSA or and compare even to classical PSA and account for the uncertainty because you have much longer time scales for circulation and eventual reactivity control. So you have some design optimization process and you have to look at both classical PRA and dynamic PRA and you have to look at seriously in detail the uncertainty associated with that. And that's why this is the point I make, the, the importance of dynamic PRA and the importance of, um, of, of the optimization and the trade-offs that you make uh, with, in this case, um, boric acid injection as a reactivity, uh, re maybe a secondary reactivity control as a consideration, okay? So um, these are kind of research questions and um, maybe for the SMR vendor, they want to finish the design so they don't have, they know that this is, a, this is an issue, but this is a research question that to be explored maybe at the university or at a research institute. So hopefully I gave you a part of an answer to your good question. Okay, thank you. I also have a question, just please clarify. Let's say we want to replace, or instead of one big reactor, we need to, to, to generate the same electricity. We need 10 SMRs, let's say, or 15 SMRs. Uh -huh. uh, from the point of view of probability of CV accidents, you, you also have to reduce the probability in order of magnitude. And it doesn't, of course, it's, uh, you can say that the soul storm is smaller, but for the public support or, let's say, acceptance, if you have any accident on the big power plant, small power plant, result will be the same for the nuclear industry. Could you mm -hmm. explain how to do it? Yeah, so that, that's a very good question. And you're right, it, it, there, there is a difference certainly in the non-technical perception of risk versus benefit of whether you have one large plant or 10, 10 to 15 small modular reactors. It depends on, I guess, on the location, right? It's because you're dealing with a part of the answer is that you're dealing with the the public acceptance of a nuclear power plant, and you know we have in, in I'm you know I'm in Toronto area, we have um, we have a Pickering generation station that's just outside of to of Toronto, and you can see the plant from the freeway, and uh, that that one one uh, plant generation site is probably objectionable if you are very anti-nuclear because it's right, it's almost within the city, right? Uh, but if you go to a remote location like a mining site, you can have a large reactor uh, or a small reactor and then there's hardly anybody there. So I think the, um, the public perception is, is one issue. The other issue is um, earthquakes from the Fukushima Daiichi accident, earthquakes are the, 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 the size of the, what, what, the wave or the tremor of the earth is much larger than a large, large, certainly much larger than a large plant or a small plant. So you do have this multi-unit or multiple SMR model that you have to convince the regulator that it's it's safe. Um, whether you have 10 to 15 small modular reactors, like you said, to replace one large plant that you may have. So, I think um, uh, one of the one of my concerns is the the scale of what is the probability of a large earthquake. But we have to remember Fukushima um, that. Did the plant shut down um, as designed? Um, and then the problem was that you had the loss of offsite power to the plant. And in addition, you had this historically large uh, tsunami. And unfortunately, you had 
some emergency diesel generators that were in the basement of the site and were flooded and became unavailable. There was one emergency diesel generator at Fukushima Daiichi that was above ground and was operating for units five and six. So that is a good design to be above the ground and inward, um, not, not right on the coast because Fukushima Daiichi plant is right on the Pacific Ocean. Some of the auxiliary and the emergency uh, systems were behind the reactor building uh, as it should be. So partial answer to your good, good question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Still, I, uh, I think the main problem here, even like you notice at Fukushima, Fukushima happens uh, in Daiichi in Japan, okay? The most influence on the public was in Germany. Germany decided completely shut down all the reactors. It does not depend whether it's small reactor or big reactor, remote area or not. It depends on this uh, general understanding of public uh, of the situation. Okay, we, sh we should go. Otherwise, we thank you very much, Akira. Yeah, thank Again, you. Again, Professor you. Takuhira, thank you for joining us. Now, I would like to ask Adrian, Professor Bozhu.